So, um, we've been engaged in the long tease uh, about Carnegie Mellon's contribution, and we're going to tease a little longer. Um, but um, you've, you've uh, started to hear some bits and pieces about uh, what's going to be in the contribution. Um, and there's already a collaboration that's been announced between Carnegie Mellon and Lumen Learning. And we want to talk a little bit about uh, what Lumen has contributed um, and what the contribution process has been uh, like and give you a sense of um, uh, what we'll be talking about tomorrow in terms of how you all might be able to collaborate and contribute. Um, so let's start with uh, you, Kim Thanos, the CEO of Lumen Learning. And uh, for those in the room who might not be familiar with Lumen, why don't you tell us a little bit about the company? Sure. So David and I started our work together actually predating Lumen. Uh, our first work was part of a Gates Foundation Next Generation Learning Challenge grant. And the challenge we took on was, can we improve success for at-risk learners using open content? And that was in 2011. That was kind of unknown. It was much more likely that our very needy friends at MIT were going to see funding and benefit from OER than the rest of us. Brandon. So, so it was, you know, just a different era. So we really, we really did work with a group of eight institutions to do a full textbook replacement. Those were all institutions that served predominantly at-risk learners. We defined that as Pell-eligible learners because that was the easiest uh, thing to measure and saw great success with that. So we went on uh, to create the company. We actually applied for a follow-on grant, a scaling grant from the Gates Foundation, and they turned it down, even though we were remarkably successful. And the feedback that they gave us was that our scaling plan was ridiculous. And Raheem Rajan said to me in that feedback, he said, you know, we have funded the idea of putting up a pretty good website to change education hundreds of times. It works 0% of the time. Go back and figure out what you did to affect change with these eight institutions and tell us how much money you need to do it with many more. And that's what we want to fund. So that, that's what really caused us to create Lumen. We felt like it was something. I would say what we did with those eight institutions was high touch. It was really working with them to understand the real problems they needed to solve, the real challenges on their campus, and to help them be successful in not just using open educational resources, but changing the way faculty members were engaging with their learning resources. So that was really the change that created. We pretty quickly after that were part of the Next Generation Courseware grant from the Gates Foundation with Smart Sparrow, with Titan Partners. There were several of us involved in that. That gave us a chance to really reimagine what courseware should be. And we continued to use open educational resources throughout that process. But truly, our answer to what courseware needed to be based on our early work was it made a tremendous difference to have students have access from their to their learning materials from day one there's still an awful lot of students who are failing. So in terms of the learning design that was needed, how could we understand why they were failing, where they were failing? How could we get them more feedback more quickly? How could we have them doing more and passively reading or choosing not to read less? And you know, those were the kinds of things we were taking on with that, that, uh, that grant. We created a courseware that's called Waymaker and have really been focused since, just to transition to the next set of things I think we're going to talk about, to then understanding where are students succeeding and where are they still struggling, and what can we do within the learning materials, within that student engagement experience, and the faculty teaching experience to improve results over time. And thank you for setting up the next question for me. So, which is, um, given that um, description of what you do, your relationship with both the content and the adopting faculty is different than, say, that of a textbook uh, pr publisher. Um, so how does that change your relationship to content-related learning analytics? What does it mean to you? What, what do you... What, what are you looking to it for? So 
One of the funny things about working in OER is that almost always when you're asking somebody to look at a different set of learning materials, there's some question about, well, how do I know that these are effective? Well, there are very few questions about how do I know that my textbook is effective. So we're asking better questions. I think that's a win. Um, it's also true that from, since so much of our work from the beginning was grant funded, there was a high bar around evaluating effectiveness and really reporting that out and looking hard at practices that didn't work. And I think that is one of the gifts that the private foundations give us is they do value failure that results in learning that informs the rest of the field. So one of the challenges I think is, so, so when uh, people started talking about OER in a more mainstream way, there was always this question of quality and how do we evaluate quality? And we really quickly wanted to go to, well, it's high quality because it looks more like a traditional publisher textbook fail. We should never be able to look at something in an educational setting and say, looks like quality. It's just ridiculous. The real question is, are students learning more effectively with this learning resource or not? And, and David asked the question early on, you know, let's look at learning outcomes per dollar. If we are saving students money to do less well in their courses, we're failing. If we're saving students money to do about the same, we should feel good and itchy to do better. So there's something there. So we really did, you know, the challenge in this was if we're just looking at DFW rates, this kind of post-mortem analysis of failure is not valuable. We need to get in front of it. As soon as the student's learning results land in the grade book, it's just too late. So we need to understand in the first moments that they're engaging with learning materials, where are the misconceptions, but we can still influence them. So really, a lot of the investment that we made in creating the Waymaker courseware doesn't show anywhere in the courseware. It's really breaking apart the learning experience into very granular outcomes, aligning content at that granular level, understanding how we assess the learning of those materials and the effectiveness of those materials, and getting those all wired up in a way that has the potential to be powerful, but doesn't really show anywhere in that. It's, it's really that underlying infrastructure. So that was really the change in mindset for us is that in order to in order to be able to influence the learning process, we have to get at it way before the final grade is in question or even a kind of module or chapter level grade would be, would be assigned. So David, with that in mind, um, you developed, uh, uh, you and a colleague, I believe, um, uh, developed uh, uh, an approach for analyzing the content called RISE. Um, could you, um, describe what that is? Sure. So um, I developed this with two uh, PhD students. Uh, I was full-time at BYU at Brigham Young University before we started Lumen, and I'm still an adjunct there. And the question is really, open content gives you permission to make any kind of changes that you want, but you don't have infinite time and you don't have infinite resources. How do you know, coming back to this question of ROI, that we were talking about a minute ago, how do you know where, if I have five hours I can invest in improving this course, where should I put that time and energy? And so the, the RISE framework, which started out as a paper that the three of us published, uh, really is asking the question, with regard to the courseware, where are students the most highly engaged and where are they doing the worst on the aligned assessments? So when you can draw the through line from a piece of content to an outcome to an assessment that's supposed to assess that uh, outcome, then you can start to ask questions about, um, well, if students are doing really poorly on this cluster of outcomes, is it because they just never bothered to read? If so, that's one question to solve. Uh, but if they're back in there looking at it again, watching the video again, doing the simulation again, doing the formative assessments again, and they're still failing uh, on the summative assessments on the other side of that, then that probably is some content raising its hand begging for improvement. And so the RISE framework is really kind of a simple two-by-two two table where you look at content engagement on the horizontal and performance on aligned assessments on the vertical. And there's this kind of up and to the right hypothesis that the more time I spend engaging with resources, the better I should do, the more learning I should be having. And so RISE is about kind of plotting out for each individual outcome in the course you know, relative, and the, you think of the origin as being the average engagement with resources and average performance on assessments, what's ending up down in that bottom corner where there's a lot higher than average engagement with resources and lower than average performance on aligned assessments? 
and can we identify those? So uh, we did a paper, we did a very manual process of doing some analysis of that to create some charts and things to put in the paper to show how that works. Uh, and then last year, uh, went and created an R package based on RISE. It's open source that got put out into the community. So um, uh, two things. First of all, R is a, a statistical analysis language, for those of you who don't know that. Um, before we get to the R, um, can you give an example of the beginning to end process of that analysis of how you improved a, a Lumen course using this? Sure. So um, our economics course is uh, kind of takes as its starting point the OpenStax uh, economics content from Rice University. And so in our, you know, the, that content, which comes to you kind of as a giant PDF, uh, as Kim talked about, you know, there's a process of identifying, I think in that course, 230, 240 individual learning outcomes, breaking the content out to align it um, to those outcomes, either finding or creating assessments that also get, so there's that whole kind of instrumentation process at the front of that, and then students use it, and then that generates both the behavioral data about what they're looking at and how often they came back in terms of the content engagement and their performance on the aligned assessments. Um, so we identified through that process uh, price ceilings and price floors related uh, issue that was going on. And then going back into the content and looking at what was there, what was provided to students, there's a graph that is fairly complicated um, with a lot going on with the supply curve and the demand curve and the demand curve is shifting and there's a new equilibrium point and then there's a price a ceiling that's set and what happens with that. There's just a bunch of stuff going on. And as you look at that, you can think, you can in retrospect, you know, 2020 vision, looking back, you can see, I can understand why students are struggling to understand everything that's happening because that graph is really carrying a lot of the instructional load in the content. So, you know, RISE can help you find where the problem is, but from that point forward, it's really somebody with some subject matter expertise or some instructional design expertise looking at it and saying, okay, I can see this isn't working, what can we do better? So in that case, that graph was taken and chopped up into six or seven parts. So it starts with just the supply curve and the demand curve intersecting and asks students some questions. You know, here's what's going on. You're in this town and rent costs this much for an apartment. Normally the town gets a lot more popular. What's going to happen to the demand curve? And so they can answer a question. And in that moment, as they answer, they get immediate feedback. And it's not just feedback that's right or wrong. It's feedback that is diagnostic or corrective in some way. And so now we shift the demand curve over. So now there's three lines on this graph, right? So basically we created an interactive that slowly built up everything that was happening in the final graph with kind of formative prompts along the way, asking what do you think is going on here? Do you understand? Do you not? So that after several kind of question answer interactions, they get to the point of the final graph, which was what was in the original paper. Uh, in the original material, but now they've been supported and scaffolded through the process of understanding everything that's happening in there. So that's the kind of improvement that was made based on identifying the problem through the RISE analysis. So basically, you use the analysis, you found a piece of content that was tied uh, uh, to a set of ass assessment questions where you saw the students were looking at the content but not doing well on the assessment questions. The The rise enabled you to make that correlation then you had to go in and apply your your skills and figure out how to refactor that content but but the 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 analysis was what saved you the time to figure out where you ought to be looking and thinking right because right? if we just asked faculty where are students struggling we would have gotten a lot of intuition based answers that may not have correlated well with what the data actually demonstrated okay so um, so then you, you were saying earlier, um, you did this originally manually, and then you um, developed a statistics program uh, that enabled you to um, do this a little bit more in a more automated way. And I think that is what brings us into Norman's world, yes? Yes. 
So, so Norman, um, you wear a number of hats here at Carnegie Mellon. Sometimes I think um, some of you, some of your, you and your colleagues have more titles than the Queen of England. So I'm going to let you um, choose which hat you're going to put on to speak from. Um, but pick up the story uh, where uh, where David leaves off. So the titles make slide design problematic. I'm trying to squeeze in all of these things. Um, uh, so uh, this relationship actually comes originally from my work with the Open Learning Initiative. I think uh, Kim and David and I have been trying to find new and interesting ways to collaborate for going on 10 years at this point. Um, starting with Kim trying to steal one of my programmers, and she's finally succeeded. I tried to steal Norman, too, and it was only his <laughs> wife that kept him in Pittsburgh. <laughs> it wasn't the university, it was the wife. So let's talk about the RISE framework. Um, because what, what we see in this case is I'm reading through David's blog post describing this framework. It's uh, pretty interesting on the one hand. Um, the thing that I remember most about that blog post was actually the immediate first comment on it. Do you remember? <laughs> May I? Please. Oh, yes. So it was great. So the, the well, without telling much more of the story, the comment basically said... This whole RISE framework idea sounds great in theory, but it can never actually work in practice because to apply this framework, you'd have to align every piece of content to an outcome. And you'd have to align every single assessment item to an outcome. Therefore, this is a fun theoretical exercise, but completely pointless. I mean, who could do this, right? This would be way too much work. Um, so at this point, we're collaborating on a number of different projects. We're trying to help out with some data analysis around the uh, Gates grant that Kim was uh, discussing. And we run into a common problem even there. It's a question of how do we take data from one proprietary system and get it to a place where someone else's analytic tools can be useful? Uh, in this case, we'd originally been trying to find some ways to get their data into data shop. But when Rise popped up, it gave me a different example of this same challenge. So David just described taking this and turning it into an R framework as though this makes the process really simple, right? Well, Norman, all that you need to do is take your data, extract it in a way that's aligned with your learning outcomes, and get it into a three-column CSV file and throw it against this R package and then dump the results into a histogram and see what comes out. Um, and this tends to be the way that far too many of these kinds of useful tools and processes uh, end up being described. We sort of gloss over these challenges of how do I munch the data into the right form and do I need to download a particular version of R and really what I'm interested in is taking data, in my case from the Open Learning Initiative courses, getting into this format and seeing if it can tell me something useful. We were really fortunate at this point to have a different project that you'll be hearing about tomorrow, uh, LearnSphere, really reach some maturity around a set of components called Tigris, a set of workflow tools that are intended to make it much easier for researchers and designers to share both the data munging parts of this pain, the analysis, and the kind of visualizations. And so RISE seemed uniquely suited to be a workflow tool that we could plug into Tigris in a way that would both be a great demonstration of LearnSphere's capabilities, but also something that was immediately useful to me. Uh, both in terms of being able to analyze OLI data, but also because I think that David's on the wrong track with page views, and this is going to allow me to take actual formative assessment and compare it to the uh, high-stakes events at the end of the course. Um, so, uh, so talk a little bit about that page view debate, because one of the... Uh, one of the interesting challenges that we have right here is uh, learning yeah. analytics tend to be these little black boxes that are implemented in proprietary tools everywhere, um, slightly differently from place to place to place. And now you're talking about this one package that is inspectable if you happen to know the very common statistics uh, programming language, if you know any statistics programming language. Um, so how would you go about resolving that conversation in the environment of, that we're talking about of LearnSphere and Tigris and R? First of all, I want to debate whether or not there's a debate. Okay. Because Are we in academia? 
I think we might be in academia. Let me problematize the concept. Because it's really the horizontal is content engagement, right? And so whatever feature engineering you want to do around that, whether it's page views or time on page or formative assessment use or page views times, time on page, you know, divided by formative, like however you, whatever feature engineering you want to do there, there are several ways that we can look at engagement with content. In that first article, page views was the one that we used. But I don't think we've ever argued that page views would be the best one to use. Well, so I'm going to take your side of the debate and say that you've never actually argued that it would be the best. Uh, what I've heard you argue and what I think is the right answer is that where we can't land is with the most perfect and most sophisticated system that no one is able to access, no one is able to use. Let's start with the tools that we have and then increase them in complexity as we can, but uh, let's bring more folks along. And I think that this kind of implementation in Tigris, one, it makes it very easy for me to do that, but it's also going to allow anyone else that has access to Tigris to do this, whether they want to create their own measures for engagement and run it through the framework, whether they think that they can take something that's a little more sophisticated than correlation and see if this gives them better ammunition for uh, making changes to courses. The notion that it's sitting in Tigris allows anyone to go in and see what's under the hood and make their own changes, but it doesn't require that level of expertise to simply use. So what we're trying to do here is progressively push back the barriers, both technological. Um, when I say technological, I'm, I'm talking about hard. You know, it's not necessarily, we don't, this is an unsolved problem, but this is a barrier for a faculty member or support staff person, right? I need to get my data into the right format. And also knowledge, right, um, of know-how in terms of the, the analysis, right? So um, we're now, we, we now are making it a little easier to implement a common framework that is explained well, visualized well, um, in a common format. If you can get somebody to uh, have on your campus who has some statistical knowledge and um, to uh, inspect it for you and you know work with you uh, to, to talk you through it, you 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 can absolutely do that. Um, so the next step is, well, let's talk about that challenge of getting people to uh, write learning objectives and tie their content uh, and their, and their uh, assessment questions. And, and, you know, that is also a know-how question and a technical question. Can you do that in your learning management system? Well, some more easily than others, right? Uh, can you do that? Does your courseware platform export that information? Well, some more easily than others. Um, so we'll be talking about that more in the next uh, day and a half. And then, um, David, I, I wonder in the few minutes that we have left, um, if you could just give a teaser for what we were talking about over lunch. This is one of these find me and ask me about things we're not really going to be able to give a full explanation of this, but um, David's been thinking about how to engage the community once you've done a little rise analysis uh, on some content. How do you engage uh, uh, people looking at content, faculty, in um, give, uh, give me a little bit uh, of your time to give me some useful feedback so that I can improve content, knowing that you, you don't have a ton of time for that feedback. Sure. Well, I'm now I'm going to take Norman's side of the argument. And at, this explanation wants to start with a quote from Herb Simon. But we're at Carnegie Mellon, and Norman is here. And I'm just going to have him recite the quote rather than me doing it, because that would be we're ridiculous. Saving that for tomorrow. No, come on. No, we're saving that for tomorrow. It's pardon to the story. <laughs> well, there's this quote by Herb Simon. <laughs> and apparently, I'm not allowed to give it yet. But a key part of it is changing from doing this work alone to doing it as part of a team, okay? And so as we've been talking about, there are technical challenges, there are know-how challenges to doing this work. And so one of the things that we've been thinking about at Lumen is how can we play a role as part of the team? So it seems like the hardest part of this is actually getting the data pulled together and doing the analysis. So 
uh, what we've just started doing, and you can see it on our website uh, now, we'll be doing a webinar on it on May 16th, is for all of our Waymaker courseware, for each of the courses that's represented there, we do a RISE analysis and publish that RISE analysis publicly so that you can see for the top 10 outcomes in each course, and by top 10, I think I mean bottom 10, the, the 10 where people were most highly engaged but doing the worst on, in terms of aligned assessment items. And that information is publicly, transparently, all available for every one of our Waymaker courses. And then for each of those learning outcomes that are identified there, those top 10, all of the content, which is all open content, remember, that's aligned with those in support of that learning is pulled out and put into a Google Doc. And that Google Doc is publicly available and is shared with suggestion permissions for anyone. So you can come into that Google Doc. Well, first, what you drop into the Google folder and review the RISE analysis and say, I don't have time to write a whole open textbook, but I have an hour that I could spend making this better in some small way. Here's an individual outcome that I actually, I do this in my classroom. I think I do it really well. Let me go see what they're doing and see if I can make that better. So then in the Google Doc, you find the, out, you find the doc in the Google Drive. You, this wants to happen in GitHub, but you can't do GitHub with faculty. So Google Docs is where it happens. So you find the Google Doc that's named with that outcome, and at the top of that doc are some, uh, some kind of stubs to help you think about ways that you might contribute. One of them is, I'm just going to read this, and I'm going to find what's obviously wrong and leave a comment that says, this is obvious to me why it doesn't work. I don't have time to fix it, but at least you know why it's broken now. You're welcome. Um, all the way from there through recommending other open content that might be used there to just dropping your cursor in and start typing. And if you've ever typed in a Google Doc in suggestion mode, you know it comes out colored and underlined and you're attributed automatically over on the side. So anyway, we've got this whole framework set up now. For our part, you know, in the team is collecting the data, doing the analysis, sharing the analysis with everyone, structuring everything to make it very easy to contribute improvements, and then providing little 30-second video tutorials around each of the kinds of improvements that you might possibly want to make. And we feel like you know, the, the hard part of the team, the team part that we can do kind of uniquely is bring all the data and the analysis together and get everything ready so that when you walk into the kitchen, kind of all the ingredients are laid out and it's ready to go. And just, just one last comment on that. I think the whole approach that we're using here, just in kind of looking more broadly at the team, has been really informed with the work we've done with the University System in Maryland with MJ Bishop, who's here today. And, you know, one of our first kind of face-to-face -face workshops, the first, the first really yeah. active workshop with a group of faculty members to engage in this, review their student learning data, and collaborate around improvements with theirs was at Ole Miss, where we have participants here also. So it's a great chance to kind of share on the ground how that's all played out. There you go. Some more networking. So now when you're sitting next, find yourself attracted to somebody familiar, you now have a couple of more folks you might not have known who you should go seek out. Thank you very much.